On behalf of the Baha'i Chair for Studies in Development, I would like to invite uh, our, our distinguished speaker uh, for today's lecture, Professor Chinme Tumbe, and our um, participants who are joining us on Zoom as well as on Facebook uh, for this very uh, thought-provoking and, and pertinent uh, uh, discussion on the theme of uh, uh, migration, which is titled India Mo Moving, Migration and Values. This talk provides a historical perspective on internal and international migration associated with India and links it with contemporary issues such as social values, federalism, nativism, urbanization, and linguistic politics. Uh, we have an excellent uh, person to help us understand this uh, and navigate this, this uh, uh, complex subject. Uh, Professor Chinme Tumbe is passionate about migration, cities, and history, and is currently faculty member in the economics area at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, an alumnus of the London School of Economics and Political Science, the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and Ruya College, Mumbai. He has been a faculty member at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad. He was a 2013 Jean Monnet Fellow at the European University Institute Florence and the 2018 Alfred D. Chandler Jr. International Visiting Scholar in Business History at Harvard Business School, Boston. His first book, India Moving, A History of Migration was published in 2018. And his second book, The Age of Pandemics, 1817 to 1920, How They Shaped India and the World, was published in 2020. Without uh, taking more time, I would uh, like to invite Professor Tumbe to um, address us on this theme today. Uh, but before we start, I'll just, uh, a, a word of, uh, uh, the reminder to our participants that they can uh, ask their questions and share their comments using the Q&A box. And uh, um, at the end of his uh, lecture, Professor Tumbe will be able to respond to your questions and comments. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for this very kind invitation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to set a slideshow in motion. Yeah, and you can see this on your screen. Uh, great. Thank you so much for this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, on a historical perspective of migration, how we got here from both on interna internal migration, international migration, uh, but I'm going to start with a sense of where we stand today. And when we talk of migration, ever since the pandemic struck, there is a kind of notion of crisis in the air. Uh, for instance, we had these horrific scenes of migrant workers walking back home uh, thousands of kilometers, um, which, uh, you know, back, back in the day during the plague in 1896, they took the trains. Here, some of them took the trains, but a lot of them walked. Uh, and it kind of exposed the underbelly of India's cities that we're not doing a great job for our migrant workers. Uh, by the government's own estimates, about 11 million people moved back. The actual numbers by some estimates are 30 million, 40 million, maybe 50 million. These are huge numbers of migrant workers who uh, had to trudge back home when the lockdown happened. And what it also showed was that we really don't know much in terms of how many migrants are there from one state to another. We have some idea of the corridors, but the exact numbers on a real-time basis are lacking. It also exposed the limited portability of social security for interstate migrant workers in particular. So that's one crisis that the pandemic showed up, saying the lives can be so precarious that 
what was projected as a three week lockdown initially, very quickly migrants took the decision uh, and a very rational decision that it makes more sense to go back home. Another set of crisis uh, word associated with migration is violence. This is just a handful of newspaper headlines just from the last five years. And, uh, you know, migrants attacked, attacked on UPN Bihar migrants, migrant workers clash with cops in Surat. Uh, there's just a bunch of stuff and it's not limited to one state or the other. Uh, it's quite pan-India. Uh, there's a sense that, you know, the sources of all our problems in especially cities are migrants. Uh, and though most of us ourselves are migrants or descendants of migrants, there is nothing more enjoyable in pastime discussions as blaming other migrants. So this othering is, is a kind of a process which is there around the world, uh, uh, especially in the realm of international migration, but uh, remarkably you know, quite prevalent in the context of internal migration in India today. And the question really is, who speaks for the internal interstate migrant workers? Uh, if you see political parties across the spectrum today, everyone wants to do this, which brings me to the third crisis, that is nativism. Every state says, you know, we're going to give jobs to our locals, which at some level seems great because you're doing something for your own people. But India is a country, and as per Article 19, we provide you know, Article 19 of the Constitution as clauses which protect the freedom of mobility, which means apart from a few parts of India, scheduled areas and so on, you can pretty much go anywhere and start work. And yet across the board, again, you see different state governments across political parties. There's really no political party saying out there saying, you know, come work, we're not going to say anything. And that's what the constitution says. So we find ourselves in this really strange situation of precarious jobs for many migrant workers. Um, uh, and I'll just end this brief discussion by pointing out the law on Haryana. If you see Haryana out here, it says 75% reservations for locals who earn less than 30,000 rupees per month. Right? And this is remarkable when you think of it. So if you earn 40,000 rupees, or if you're an IT guy and earn 80,000 to one that, you can move anywhere in India, right? But the minute you are poor, suddenly you have a law which says, no, we don't want you, we want our locals, right? And the reason often that locals don't do jobs is because they want to do other things, right? So it's not like migrants are stealing jobs from locals. In most cases, that's not the case. And there's really no evidence to suggest it either. So there's a sense of crisis in migration. So we, what we want to understand is, what is, what is migration in India? How have people thought about it? And how did we get here in the first place? And I work in the realms of economics and history. And I often find that it's often useful to go back to history to kind of find, you know, uh, uh, what are the patterns in migration that we're seeing over time? And what can maybe be done in going forward? So I'll start this story today with this picture. It's a, a, a lovely uh, illustration from the London Illustrated News in the late 19th century. So this is about exactly 150 years old. And what it shows you is the different forms of migration in India. That is, how did people move? And you see, you have, you know, it's called tramps, Hindu pilgrim, traveling beggar. Uh, you have the riding elephant, the palki dock, the billy. So different forms. And what this projection of colonial power celebrated, of course, was the bottom panel, which is the arrival of the railway train, right? And it's not surprising that the railway train is the most synonymous thing with Indian migration. My book cover is, has the Indian train. Uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a remarkable institution which has been there since about 1853. And during COVID also, the shramic trains were, uh, you know, used to uh, eventually uh, transport migrants. Uh, so the Indian railway, what it did when it came in the 1850s is its dramatic expansion in the late 19th century for the first time quickened the pace of movement within the country. It is not like people did not migrate before the 1850s. We have a very long history of internal migration in India as well. But what we say is that there was a clear rupture in the late 19th century where movement intensified. Uh, and it's a process which you know ha happened very. So there's there's a there's a sharp uh, uh, disruption which happens in the late 19th century when people around India start to move, but they move in a particular way. They don't move. Uh, for example, I have moved to Ahmedabad and I'm here for seven years. Of course, I have family in different parts of India. I keep in touch. I visit. I go on vacations. But broad and 
more, most broadly, I'm stationed in Ahmedabad. The movement we are talking about is a remarkable movement, which is what I call as semi-permanent in nature. Right? So they're not moving permanently. They're not also moving for like a day or two. They're going for a few months, working, and then coming back. And turns out that this is, in a way, the dominant form of work-related mobility, I argue, for the last 150 years. And I'm going to show you some evidence to that effect. Okay. But before that, some pictures. Uh, this is a, a photograph of a migrant family from a district called Ratnagiri. Many of you know Ratnagiri has been famous for mangoes. Less known story is that it's also famous for mangoes. It's a history of mass male migration for about 130 years. And this photograph is about a family where the gentleman you see out here worked as a worker in the docks in Ratnagiri for his entire life. There's a photo taken in Mumbai. But the women out here are there for the photograph, but otherwise they were pretty much in Ratnagiri. And the sons that you see in this photograph eventually grew up to also go to Mumbai, work, and then go back to Ratnagiri. Right? So in this one photograph, we're capturing a lot of migration history where the women are home, the man is going out. And this kind of general work-related migration is quite dominant in many parts of India. There are some places now where women are moving on their own, but it's the minority. It's not really uh, the case for work reasons. This is another photograph, uh, which is uh, showing you a group of people from a district called Udupi, which is a district very famous for, so if Ratnagiri is famous for mangoes, Udupi is famous for South Indian restaurants. And uh, there's a reason why those restaurants are very famous, because those restaurants were built all across India through the work of migrants. Uh, and again, these migrants did not settle down in those cities. Uh, they worked, they made their restaurants, and eventually they went back to Udupi. So what we're talking about is circular migration. This is a phenomenon of India, where people have one leg in the village and one leg in the city. And that's why so many people went back home during the pandemic. Uh, this particular photograph is uh, my own family, uh, who, which came from Udupi. Uh, my father is sitting at the bottom right. He's been photoshopped into this a picture. He's wearing a bow tie. He looks very different from the rest because he was not born at the time this picture was taken. But to make him feel good, you know, they, my his siblings basically photoshopped him uh, later on. But this is that rare family from Udupi which actually settled down in Bombay. Interestingly, a few of these people are now, even now in Udupi. Right? So my father's sister, for example, has gone back to Udupi. What I'm trying to portray is that between this family and this family, it ca captures a lot of the migration, that is the single male migration versus the family migration where you sit down and invest. In now, why is it that in some cases you can put down your feet in the city and some not? We're going to come to that in just a bit. But I told you about two districts, this photo of Ratnagri and this photo of Udupi. What do the numbers look like? Remarkable, right? The x-axis on this chart is the census here. And the y-axis out here is the sex ratio, which in India, as you know, is a very controversial indicator because of gender discrimination and younger ages and so on. But what I'm talking about here is not the phenomenon of missing women, which Amar Kusen famously talked about, but the phenomenon of missing men. Uh, the men of Ratnagiri Rupi have been missing for a long time, and they were found, of course, in Mumbai and destination regions. But look at this chart. From 1901 to 2011, uh, Ratnagri and Udupi have basically not seen their sex ratios below 1,100 females to 1,000 males. And I hope you appreciate this, you know, the, the intensity of this chart, because what it's telling you is that the migration you're seeing today is not new. It's been going on for a really long time. And you can pinpoint the starting point of this, again, as I said, in the late 19th century. So what I'm pointing out is that India has many of these districts which have been sending out this classic single male migrants for a really long time. And it's important to pay attention to these migrations because, as you saw what happened during the pandemic, uh, if, you, if you snap their connections, um, uh, you know, people will uh, tend to go back home. So how does migration in India look like today? I think this is a good chart to give you a sense of how, where people are moving away from. So this is a chart of the source regions. And it's a district-level map of India. I've deliberately not shown state boundaries because we tend to think of migration as, you know, Oh, a lot of people go to Gujarat, a lot of people go to Maharashtra, and a lot of people move away from Bihar, and a lot of people move away from Uttar Pradesh. Turns out that almost every state of India, including Maharashtra, including Gujarat, have pockets of out-migration. 
So there are pockets of in-migration. So when we say people are going to Gujarat, what we typically mean is people are going to Surat and Ahmedabad. Right? But there are a lot of districts in Gujarat. You'll see the red shaded districts out here where more than 25% of households in those districts are sending a person out to work. Right? So those districts, for example, are Bhavnagar, where people go to work in the diamond industry of Surat. Um, if you see this map, the red shaded districts are India's mass migration zones. And as I've argued in different you know, uh, papers and my book, this is not new. This has been going on since the late 19th century. Okay. I call those red shaded districts as being a part of what, the great Indian migration. The great Indian migration wave has these three fundamental properties. It's male dominated. The women are usually back home. It's semi-permanent. They're never really settling down. And it's remittance based, which means think of the psychology of the migrant worker. The psychology is not to stay and invest yourself in the city. It is to earn as much money as possible, save and send back the money home to support your family. And most importantly, most importantly to set yourself up for retirement. So a lot of the migrants in India, and these are, we're talking of tens of millions of people, they actually come to our cities, but don't want to settle down, right? Which is a complete negation of the standard view of the insider saying, oh, these guys are coming from outside and taking over our lands. Actually, most of them are going back, right? Uh, and uh, they're going back because partly their families are there. Uh, and, you know, researchers have tried to understand why is migration so circular in India compared to many other parts of the world. So there are reasons both in the destination region and the source region. One argument is that cities are very hostile. We don't have affordable housing for our migrants. So it's very difficult to get a foothold in the city in India, which is why a lot of migrants basically at the first sight go back, just like we saw during COVID. There are other reasons as well coming from the destination side, uh, from the source side, which is for instance, people are very attached to their native lands. For example, during COVID, we heard this saying of many migrants on the railway station saying, Agar marna hai, to gao mein marengi. Right? It's a very powerful kind of sentiment, which tells you that, look, my ultimate home is the village, and that's where I want to die. That's where I want to retire. Right? And so that is what the psychology which conditions are of migration. It also kind of tells you uh, about gender. In a lot of places of India, the women are not expected to move out. Right. So mobility is allowed for men, but not for women. So automatically, irrespective of how welcoming the city is, there are factors in the source region itself which condition migration to be quite similar. Okay. Now, the red-shaded districts, as you see, what is the one commonality between all the red-shaded districts is that they're all places with high population density on arable land. Okay, So you look at Rajasthan, you think it's a desert, low population density, but actually it has high population density on the amount of arable land that exists. Right? So if you ignore basically desert land, you look at just agricultural land and you calculate the rural population density on that, it turns out to be you know, uh, not that low. So the fundamental driver of out-migration India is not poverty, but density. Right? That is, there is only that much that agriculture can support. And remember, Indian population has almost quadrupled over 100 years. So the same land, four times more population, it really can't absorb that many jobs out there. So there's a pressure to move. That is why India's poorest state on many dimensions, Bihar, and India's richest state on many dimensions, Kerala, have the same rates of outmigration. Right? Now, nobody in their living mind would say that, hey, you know, uh, Kerala, things are so, so nice in relative terms. Why are people living in Kerala? Now, where are people going from Kerala? They go to the Gulf. They go to other parts of India, but mostly international migration to so what's common between Bihar and Kerala is not work capital income or poverty rates, but it is density. Both Bihar and Kerala have very high population density. And that is because partly because of history, about settlement structure, about water, access to water, a lot of geographic reasons and historical reasons for that. Uh, coastal Orissa are very interesting because cyclones play a very important role in this region historically. Migration is a very stable livelihood uh, strategy for this particular region. Uh, Himalayan states, Uttarakhand, Him uh, Himachal Pradesh, also are remittance economies. They survive on remittances coming from Delhi. A lot of the jobs that these people get in are in manufacturing services, but broadly what researchers call as informal sector. Right? Most of these jobs are like what we saw in the COVID. These are cooks, these are plumbers, these are electricians, these are guys who work in our houses, these are domestic helps. This is a huge range of informal sector jobs, as we know. 
about 70% of urban jobs are in the informal sector. Uh, these, this map also shows you a few circles in the middle. You know, so what are these circles? Uh, they show aspects of seasonal migration, which is very short-term migration, which happens for a few months of the year. Right? So you'll see this border very close to Indore, for instance, uh, comprising of Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, and uh, Maharashtra. This is a tribal zone, right? And a lot of this migration happens now to Surat and Ahmedabad. But they go not for like eight months or 10 months in the year, like security guards, for instance, but they're going mostly in the construction sector or the agricultural harvesting operations for a few months. So this is called seasonal. So there are three fundamental types of work-related migration based on duration. Short-term seasonal for a few months, semi-permanent, which is like, you know, 10 months in a year, and then one or two months you go back to your village, typically during monsoon, and then you come back again. And permanent guys like me who are stationed in one place for a long time. Permanent does not mean forever, but typically in census terms, it means for at least more than one year. So you're there for some time. Uh, urbanization, how does urbanization? Urbanization is the flip side of out-migration. So not surprisingly, the map on the left shows you the pockets which are urban in India. And the map on the right is the same map I showed you where people are moving away from, right? So out-migration on the right and urbanization on the other side. And you'll see that this place along the Gangetic Valley that is Bihar and Eastern UP is not only dense, but it's very rural, right? Uh, and there are pockets between Surat, Mumbai, Pune. There is a pocket in Tamil Nadu. There's a pocket Delhi, Jaipur. And broadly, you'll see that there's really nothing much in terms of an urban cluster between Delhi and Kolkata. Right? So not surprisingly, uh, this is unfortunately one of the poorest parts of India. Uh, and migrants from this region go all over India. Earlier, in fact, all over the world. Uh, but, uh, but there are not too many centers out there. So actually, very few people go to Patna. And a lot of people from Patna go to other cities. That is also an emerging phenomenon of India, what is called as urban to urban migration. So there are two kinds of cities in India. Very important to understand this. For example, if you live in Mumbai or Surat or Delhi, most of the people who come from outside come from villages, which means rural to urban migration. But if you live in Pune or Bangalore or Chennai, most of the migrants come from other urban areas, right? And the nature of these two cities is thus very different. You have the rural to urban migrant in the city and you have the urban to urban migrant, right? And that is why the nature of uh, conflicts, issues is quite different in these two very different classes of cities. To give you a sense of how these migrants come from, and I'll tell you how this has implications, we say Mumbai is the most cosmopolitan city of India. This is a bit old data, it's like 20 year old data, but broadly the patterns hold. It's a, it's a heat map. What is this? It's a heat map. A heat map basically is kind of showing where does Mumbai get its migrants from, right? And you'll see how Mumbai takes in migrants from all over India, right? Of course, it gets a lot of people from Maharashtra and Gujarat, which are close by. Distance does matter. But then you would think that a lot of people from Madhya Pradesh go to Mumbai, but you get a lot more people from UP and Bihar and Mumbai than Madhya Pradesh. That's the power of migration networks. So while obviously it's easier to move short distances versus long distances, we are more likely to go from Mumbai to Surat rather than Mumbai to you know, uh, Buenos Aires in South America because it's so far away. So distance matters. But apart from distance, networks matter. Who you know in the city matters a lot. And that is why the guys from UP and Bihar have established themselves in Mumbai for more than 100 years uh, and that is why those networks are so strong, in which case distance disappears. Because as long as you know someone out there, you can always get into that city. Delhi has got most people from the Gangetic Valley. You look at Kolkata, it's almost completely from its hinterland. Kolkata as a city has also been losing people to migration. So not many people are going to Kolkata on a net basis. Uh, Surat is one of India's fastest growing cities. You'll see how it draws more than 100,000 migrants from just one district on coastal Odisha, which is called Ganjam, right? So they take this Puriyoka Express um, and go all the way across India to work in Gujarat. A lot of these migrations have historical roots. I'm gonna take a pause from labor migration and talk very briefly about the migration of capital, that is money and moneyed people, rich people, typically traders, business people, and so on. And the names we typically associate with in India are the Marwadis, uh, the Gujarati Banyas are, uh, you know, Sindhis, Punjabis, Chettiars in the South, 
who we don't talk about too much today, but 100 years back were very powerful. Why do we need to understand these migrations? Because often what happens is that when business people and traders go to new places, they are often seen as an outsider. So you have the migrant worker who is often seen as the outsider and blamed for crime, rapes, murders, all sorts of things, even if there's very little evidence to suggest that migrants commit this more than non-migrants and so on. But another source of irritation for many people is to see people rich. So people, insiders often have a problem with outsiders who are poor. They also so many times have a problem with outsiders who are rich, who feel like these rich people are taking our wealth. These rich people are taking our money. So that is why Marwadis was called, they were called parasites in Calcutta in the early 20th century by a famous nationalist, right? Marwadis uh, across India have faced a lot of challenges because wherever they went, they went typically as money lenders and money lender has this very bad connotation in India as an exploitative kind of agent. So you see this conflict between the moneyed class as they move. Many of these times, they were completely unsubstantiated attacks against these business communities. Uh, and you know, in many cases, they've had to leave places across time. There's a whole chapter in my book, if you're interested to know the histories of these migrations, I would talk about that. And finally, a bit about international migration. We talk about internal migration. I've given you a glimpse of where people move. Uh, where did people go to? And it really started in a huge way in 1834. There's a famous picture of hill coolies. These were people from Jharkhand today, Chota Nagpur Plateau, who basically were taken to Mauritius in 1834. And that began a wave of migration where over 30 million Indians moved from Indian shores outside between about 1834 and 1930, right? Most of them came back. Again, this was semi-permanent migration, but they moved to a variety of destinations around the world and the destination they went were all the red labeled countries, countries like South Africa, remember Mohandas Gandhi, Trinidad and Tobacco, Suriname, the West Indian uh, uh, kind of places, Guyana, East Africa, right? A lot of Gujaratis in East Africa, for instance. Uh, Burma, Sri Lanka, Malaysia were the major sources of uh, Indian migrants. Remember the famous song, Nere Piage Rangoon, Rangoon being a city in, in Burma. This was the old migration. Of course, Indians still live there. Their descendants live there. They're called the diaspora, right? But today, Indians go mainly to USA and UAE and a bit of UK. So the three U's, I call it the U-turn in the 20th century, right? And you see how these countries have absorbed a lot of Indian migrants. Uh, we say now that, you know, about 20 to 30 million uh, a strong Indian diaspora outside. And these guys send in a lot of money, remittance. And where does it go to? It goes to some of our big cities like Mumbai and Bangalore, but it also goes to the districts that I've shown in this map on the right. It goes a lot to Kerala, where the remittance to GDP ratio is almost 30%. It goes to Punjab, close to the Hoshiarpur belt, mainly from Canada and Italy. There are about 200,000 Punjabis now who work in Italy, apart from the Canada migration. Uh, Northern Telangana, uh, uh, Northern Rajasthan, and even UP and Bihar. In fact, UP and Bihar now send more labor migrants to the Gulf countries than even Kerala. That's a development that's happened in the last five or 10 years, right? So this is just a snapshot of how people have moved across. Uh, and if you want to know the histories of why are there so many Keralites in the Gulf or why are there so many you know, uh, 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 people from South India in the US, uh, read my chapter on this particular thing in my book. Uh, a sense of this international migration, of course, comes with a sense of development. And uh, a famous cartoon by R.K. Lakshman, it says, remember the carpenter who lived there? Well, he's an NRI now. He had emigrated the Gulf and is back. And it shows this image of squalor and you know, poverty and this one bright house, right? And this often happens in migration corridors where people want to show off that they've arrived and they put the money back home to make a very nice. So that's why the first thing that happens in migration typically is you get a fresh coat of paint on your house. You have to tell people that you're doing well. There is another kind of migration, which is involuntary migration, right? And involuntary migration can happen in all sorts of ways. It can happen because of riots. I live in a city, uh, Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad has had at least 30 years of riots between you know, 1960, uh, 1970 and 2002. Um, <clears throat> we've also had, for example, the exodus of the Kashmiri Pandits uh, in 1990. We've had damn induced displacements. So all sorts of conflicts lead to displacements. Some of them can be from the city to the exterior of the city. Some of them can be from a state to another state. But the really big ones right, in Indian history were the three partitions of the 20th century. 
Two, you're probably well aware of India and Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan 1971 means the creation of Bangladesh. Uh, but Burma was actually the first in 1937 when it was separated. And that led to about half a million Indians literally walking back from the northeast of India back into, uh, uh, you know, uh, to their different places that they were going from. Um, and involuntary migration caused by the partition of India in 1947 and partition of Pakistan in 1971 continue to be political hotspots and political tension and political flare points today, especially in northeast India. You can't understand Northeastern migration politics, which is very delicate, very tense, uh, without understanding these partitions which happened and the way in which they ruptured existing migration streams. Again, historical context is very important in these regions. But again, you can see the othering, right? The minute you, you hear the word Bangladeshi immigrant today in India, right? Uh, there's a sense that this person is an illegal immigrant, this person is maybe taking Indian jobs. There's a whole negative impression created about the Bangladeshi immigrant who's come for work, whereas Indian migrants, a lot of them on illegal contracts outside, you know, we often have sympathy. So if an Indian migrant is affected outside, we say, oh, this country has worked badly against it. But there's a special kind of schizophrenia where a lot of us want Indians to do well outside, but will not offer the same benefits to migrant immigrants who want to come here. The other country which has a lot of uh, sent a lot of people to India is Nepal. India has an open border with Nepal. A lot of Indians go to Nepal. A lot of Nepalese come. I've talked a lot about migration. I talked about men's migration and so on. But would you believe it if I told you that actually most people who migrate in India are women? Not necessarily for work, though that also happens, but mainly for marriage. Right. And so, as a result of which, virtually every adult woman in India almost by census definition is a migrant. Because if you leave your village upon marriage and go to another village, which could be quite far sometimes, you're counted as a migrant. Right? And this is the migration map of women in India, where the yellow is less and the, the kind of blues and patches are very high. And what it shows is that basically, in places where there are strict rules that the woman has to leave and go somewhere for marriage, you're going to get a much higher migration. Right? So women are the most, uh, 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 count as the most number of migrants in India. So a quick over, overview of the numbers. We say virtually every adult woman in India is a migrant. That's about 300 million plus women uh, who are migrants. We say there are over 100 million circular migrant workers. Uh, you know, um, the census only shows about 40 to 50 million people, but uh, the numbers are expected to be, uh, has been estimated to be much more. We say about one, one in three people in the country is a migrant and about 20 to 30% of the workforce is we say about 30 million strong international diaspora and a few million immigrants. We don't know how many, uh, but it's definitely not you know, the, the, num the numbers we typically see, like 20 million, 30 million. So. And so why do people migrate? Uh, one of the reasons people migrate is, of course, money. If you ask people why they are working in a different city, they'll say, you know, because they open their stomachs. Uh, so they're coming here for the money. Uh, wage difference is important because earlier, for example, people from North India would not go to South India that much. Why? Because you have to learn a new language. You know, if you're a Hindi speaker, how can you go to Tamil Nadu? But today, the wage differential is so high that you don't mind learning Tamil. You don't mind learning Malayalam. Uh, or you don't mind, mind you know, not knowing the language because if you're getting five times as much uh, a wage, then you know, it's a very lucrative portion. And that is why we're seeing a lot of north to south migration pick up in India. But wages is not the only thing. Anonymity, a very famous caste oppression, for example, is arguably much more intense in villages than cities. Famous you know, saying in Mumbai, a city I belong to, is that nobody can talk about untouchability in the Bombay local train, in the Mumbai local train, because you know, we're all just packed. Uh, uh, you know, there are like thousands of people in one train, and uh, notions of purity, untouchability, you know, kind of vanish out of the window. It doesn't mean that caste goes away in cities, but the notion of caste in cities is arguably quite different. And a lot of studies on caste and cities shows, actually, especially, you know, for example, the whole literature on Dalit entrepreneurship, that the city's anonymity is great to try out new things. You often try out stuff outside your, you know, your standard occupations because nobody's going to judge you for it. Nobody's going to criticize you for it. You're outside the standard kind of uh, social mores. Peer pressure, right? So sometimes you might just move because others around you are moving. Right? So you have a nice job in Kerala, but everyone is in the Gulf. So you also want to go to the Gulf. 
right? It's a very standard kind of peer pressure logic which is working out there. Networks manage, as I said, education. Huge part of migration for, among the youth today is education. And if you're a bureaucrat, transfers, you know, government employees keep getting pushed around. Migration researchers often call this the pull factors. You also have push factors like economic distress, as I mentioned, you know, political turmoil, natural disasters, and so on. And with climate change, this is, of course, now an important issue. Having said this, no migration is ever a combination of purely pull or purely push. It is always a combination of both together. Right? Uh, and that is important. I've already mentioned this, durations of migration, why people move. Uh, I've already talked about caste, gender. I've shown you regions. What about religion? Can we say that Hindus move more than Muslims or vice versa and so on? It turns out that most of this is region specific, right? So if you are in Kerala, it doesn't really matter as to which religion you belong to. Most people in Kerala move much more than say Madhya Pradesh, right? Whereas if you look at just the national statistics, it seems that the Muslims, for example, move less, but that's because most Muslims in India live in Western Uttar Pradesh, which as a region, has historically not supported movement. So even Hindus out in Western Uttar Pradesh don't move that much than say Eastern Uttar Pradesh. And we know in Eastern Uttar Pradesh, Muslims and Hindus move a lot. So what I'm trying to point out is that more than gender, caste, and religion, region matters, right? And when a migration bug comes in a region like in Kerala, everyone sees it around them. And so it's a bug that kind of infects everyone uh, out there. And everyone gets a spirit of moving in those places. All right. Coming now to this idea of migration and values, migration and development, and you know different perceptions of migration. And uh, I'll start with this notion of development. And in my book, my last chapter looks at this concept. And I kind of try and uh, address it by looking at three you know, uh, thinkers. Uh, Balthagar, right? So uh, a famous politician, there's a movie made on him now uh, of the Shiv Sena political party in Mumbai, had a very clear view saying that, you know, what is migration for? In this whole debate on migration and development, the number one priority should always be natives, right? So his idea was that sons of the soil, right? Sons of the soil is a very powerful kind of uh, a slogan in nativist movements, not just in Mumbai by Bharat but in Assam and a lot of places in India. And his idea was that if people are going to move, they better make the natives better off, right? Uh, so that was the kind of fundamental kind of thing. So this is what I would call as a nativist position, where you're fundamentally looking after your own uh, uh, people, right? And outsiders are typically seen to threaten the equilibrium of, of the place. Now, Gandhi had a very interesting view. Now, Gandhi, in his own lifetime, moved a lot. Okay, so, I mean, he was practically on the move, you know, uh, uh, every working day of his life, going some way or the other. His, you know, un, when he was in South Africa, he moved a lot. And then, of course, when he came to India, the first thing he did was to take the train and go around the country and then continued moving. He was probably the most traveled person in Indian uh, uh, freedom struggle. Yet Gandhi's view on migration is very interesting. He believed in the power of village republics, and he kind of saw migration as a bad thing. He said that migration should be done if there's caste oppression. So if you want to leave caste oppression, move. But otherwise, his view on migration was develop the village so that nobody has to move. Right? It's a very powerful notion in development discourse of India. That is, if only we develop our villages, nobody will have to move. Is that really the case? About five decades of development discourse in India has now given way to a very different discourse, saying that migration is inevitable. It is the most stylized fact of economic development that as countries get richer, they urbanize, people choose to live in larger settlements. It could be a small town, it could be a city, but people move away from villages. Even in India, the richest agricultural tracts like coastal Andhra Pradesh at one point Punjab, what did they do with the money? They went to the nearest towns. In coastal Andhra Pradesh, they went to the US. Right? So what happens with income is that you kind of move away from agriculture to non-agricultural activities. And so in a way, migration is inevitable. And one person who saw that very clearly was Ambedkar. And Ambedkar saw it for two reasons. One, from the perspective of economic development, but he also saw this as a release from caste oppression. And so Ambedkar is very clear in his writing saying move, right? He says, migration is the best thing to happen. Uh, he says, what is a village but a den of ignorance and so on. He had very strong words against village. So Gandhi and Ambedkar had diametrically opposite views. 
Gandhi did not kind of, uh, 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 he was not a nativist in a strong sense, but he believed in the idea that people should not move uh, uh, because you know, if you only give them all the facilities, then things would be fine. Right? So three very different contrasting views and a lot of the migration conflicts that we have, even in our day-to-day -day discussions with our friends, family, can be kind of slotted within these three perspectives. Uh, my own view is the Ambedkar right? view. It comes from this, it, I should also say that our own perceptions on migration come from our own exposures in life, right? So Thakre himself traveled very less in his life. Right? Most of his life was Pune and Mumbai. Right? Ambedkar traveled a lot. Gandhi traveled a lot. Uh, and I myself have had the opportunity to travel a lot. And when you travel a lot, when you meet a lot of different kinds of people, I do think your worldview becomes automatically very pro-migration, right? And here's a conflict because the pro-migration guys think that this is the norm. And the kind of nativist anti-migration folks say, no, that is not the norm. This is our norm. And you outsiders are kind of unstable, unstable uh, you know, destabilizing. This. So for example, a character like Donald Trump, who for years rallied against immigrants in the US, takes a strong nativist line saying that you know, America is for Americans and immigrants, despite America being the land of immigrants for about 400 years, there's still this idea that the native should be given more uh, uh, incentives. So classical migration concerns in this world of migration values, uh, I mentioned nativism, uh, assimilation. Right? Is there then, one? it's one thing to take a position saying one should be nice to all human beings and migrants being human beings, we should be nice to them. So that's a, a kind of a value system. Is there something that the migrant should be doing as well? Right? Um, uh, shouldn't there be some responsibilities of migrants? So suppose I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I speak Marathi. If I come to Gujarat and I start abusing Gujaratis, if I start abusing Gujarati speakers, right? I think the Gujarati is going to be very, very concerned and is well within the person's right to kind of retaliate or, and say stuff like, you know, these migrants, they come and disparage our culture. So there is also, I, I believe, a responsibility of the migrant that you can't just go to a place and kind of put down their local cultures. Be a good mig uh, being a good migrant also means uh, uh, you do not have to accept everything in your new culture, but you need to respect the place that you're going to. Right? Uh, a famous uh, anecdote regarding the Parsi assimilation in India, it's a very powerful legend in the Parsi universe, is that when the, when the folks came uh, uh, you know, to India first in close to Navsari in Gujarat, uh, the king, this is many centuries ago, uh, there's no way to ascertain this, it's like folklore, uh, but the king said, you know, why should we take you? Why should we keep you in our kingdom? Uh, and the Parsi uh, folks of that time said, uh, you know, we are like sugar in milk, right? We will, sugar in milk is a fantastic analogy on assimilation. It basically says, we will dissolve, you won't not, not even notice us, and we will make it sweeter. Right. So it's not only about you not being able to notice us as someone different, but we will enrich your culture. Right. And that, I believe, is what the goal of any migration policy should be, is a, a kind of get a sense of assimilation. And a lot of the hate we are seeing in Indian society across the world is because this assimilation is not happening. We live in highly segregated zones with this very little interaction between communities, between migrants and, and non-migrants as well. Uh, transnationalism is this concept of migration connecting across borders. Uh, networks I've talked about a bit. And then there are also concerns about when these migrants go uh, and spend long periods of time away from their homes, what happens when the families left behind? And right? what happens? There are issues of loneliness, there are issues of kids without fathers for a long time. So clearly, I, for example, support family-based migration. I think most migration, you know, you should not have these uh, dislocated families and so on. There's also a concept called social remittances that is not just money that goes back home, but the value systems from urban areas which go back home, which could be, quote unquote, good or bad. Right? Uh, so, for example, a lot of consumerism, if you think excessive consumerism is, is horrendous, that gets transported via social remittances from cities to villages. Right? Uh, a lot of other norms, for example, education norms, norms on education, which I think are positive that everyone should have an education uh, also kind of can, can move through via social remittances from uh, cities to villages. I'm going to end now in a couple of slides. Um, to, to summarize, you know, this, this broad idea, what I've given, what I've tried to talk about here is A, give an overview of how people move in India. Uh, this is not something new. It's been happening for a long time. Migration conflicts have happened, uh, but not at a very, very systematic level. Of course, partition was a migration event with horrific violence. But after that, 
yes, we've had, you know, unfortunately, riots, violence, and people get displaced. But work-related migration, barring a few pockets like Assam or Mumbai, there has been acceptance. India has also this interesting history of acceptance of outsiders. Right? So I mentioned the Parsis, the Baghdadi Jews, a lot of communities have come over time and assimilated uh, and, and, and enriched uh, uh, Indian culture. Uh, it, so I'll end with this idea that, you know, uh, when we talk about migration and values, a fundamental uh, uh, issue which is driving concerns in the 21st century, in fact, my book talks about this as being the most important issue of the 21st century, is if, if you had capitalism versus communism as the big issue of the 20th century, you see how central this is now becoming. It's not just an Indian issue. When Donald Trump says, you know, uh, we should shut down borders and so on, uh, this now becomes a global issue where people around the world are becoming more nativist, saying we need to protect our, our culture. It's also been a backlash against globalization, saying globalization is diluting our local cultures. And my own view is that migration is not only good, is the reason whatever plurist, pluralistic traditions India has had and what we celebrate has been because of migration. Uh, by promoting more migration, you basically get, hopefully, you know, uh, uh, more pluralism because people in touch with each other, people know what's happening in different parts of the country. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, they uh, uh, are more likely to promote pluralism. On that note, I'll end. I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, if you are interested in migration, I compiled a bibliography freely available online. I have a personal website, and on this website, there are a lot of resources on migration. This bibliography lists 3,000 studies on Indian migration. And so it's, it's a topic which has been researched, but one can always do more research on. Uh, and if you have nothing to do, you can go to YouTube and watch a movie called Gaman, which is a classic movie on migration about the choice of whether to, to move from a village to city, and then, then uh, when you don't make it big, should you go back or not? Right? And it kind of tells you about the central dilemmas that, that migrants uh, often face. Uh, these are the two books I've written. One is on migration, one is on pandemics. I've not talked about pandemics today, uh, but you should know that migration, a lot of migration happened during pandemics. Uh, also run a history internship program. And if you're students and you, know, you want to uh, uh, try out an internship in broadly business or economic history, uh, just search IMA history internship on, on Google. And I run two social media handles uh, on business and economic history. So on that note, I'll end. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much again. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tumbe. This was uh, really a, a panoramic view of the, the issue, uh, complex issue of migration, which uh, you really, and, and values, and, and you really helped in a sh short period of time to give us a sense of all the issues, the, the nuances, the um, uh, also give us a textured reading of the reality of migration in India. So we, we are running short of time. I'll quickly go to the questions. Uh, is migration inevitable to addressing poverty? Is there a moral case for preventing migration? I think he, this uh, participant probably means in the sense in which Gandhi would yeah. have said and allowing people to serve their own communities or regions. Should I read a couple of questions together? No, I, can, I, I can see them, so maybe I'll just- Okay, sure, sure, okay. Yeah. So the first question, very interesting question. Uh, so thank you all for uh, you know, writing these excellent questions. So is migration inevitable to addressing poverty? So you have to understand how poverty works, right? I mean, one view of migration is, hey, people are moving from villages to cities and a lot of them live in slums. So that's a transfer of rural poverty into urban poverty, right? I'll make a distinction here that on most dimensions, urban poverty, just by using the word poverty, doesn't mean it's the same thing. The urban poverty nature is much relatively, in relative terms, you know, less serious than the rural poverty. Rural poverty often is no food. Urban poverty, the food question in most cases is sorted. Then it's a question of nutrition, it's a question of you know, sanitation, a variety of things. So when we look at our access to education, health is much better in urban areas than rural areas. So just by saying that you're poor on, on certain definitions uh, doesn't mean, I mean, you know, there, there's work which basically shows even if you're in an Indian slum, you're better off than a huge part of rural India. 
So this movement from one place to another uh, is still, I mean, you have to ask this question, why are so many people moving if they're going to end up in a slum? It's because they're making a calculated decision. They feel that this is still better than the place we're coming to, right? Uh, uh, they, you know, this question I would ask to migrants from Gujarat, for 100 years, you guys are on the move. Why are you guys doing this? And they would say, this is a, a stable livelihood strategy because in our place, we have cyclones. And if a cyclone comes, we're just devastated. So people are making calculations, you know, but it's not like being in a rural area is a, is a risk. Migration has a lot of risks. Your job might disappear. A lot of things can happen. A pandemic lockdown can happen. But agriculture is very risky as well, right? And if it doesn't rain, you know, you don't know what to do. So, uh, so migration in a relative sense is often a safer bet for many people in India. So if you're looking at it as a researcher, you might think, you know, why are people doing this? But from their perspective, it is often a very rational case to move. Uh, is it inevitable? I think one should see migration or how can people support or view this. The discourse earlier was to prevent migration, right? For example, the Mandrega, largest social security scheme in the world, has a clause in it saying, well, one of the objectives is to reduce distress migration. Not migration, but distress migration. Of course, very tough to you know, define what is distress migration and so on. Uh, but in the long run, you want people to move more. Right? And I'll tell you why. There's, there's a very strong caste question that comes into play. Right? Historically, people who left villages first were actually upper ranking castes. Right? So Brahmins, et cetera, and so on. So as a result today, if you look at just India's overall distribution, the, the urbanization rate among the general category, for instance, is over 40%. And at the scheduled caste, it's 20%. So what, what is happening? So it's, it's like, you know, if you're saying that people should stay where they are, well, the opportunities are much more in the urban centers. And over time, you're going to lose out much more, right? So, so there's that question also then of inequality uh, um, apart from uh, poverty. Across the world, there is no country in the world which has become, which has provided its citizens with a decent level of living and not urbanized and not had migration. Not a single country. You can tell me a single country which is you know, reasonably uh, 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 doing well for its uh, citizens and does not have an urbanization rate of more than 50%. It's, 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 it's not there, right? So, so, the, so if you're saying it's in, so, and that's why we say it's inevitable. Now we can always have our chart our own development outcomes and so on. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of well-meaning folks, you know, who spend their entire lives working with uh, grassroots, uh, uh, movements and so on, had this notion that, look, if we only do these things, people will stay. But what we're seeing across India time and again is people still move. So yes, I do think it is inevitable. Uh, and we need actually more migration, not less, but more migrations of the non-distressed kind. You don't want people moving around because they're completely helpless. You want people to move with some capital, with some money so that they can invest a bit in the destination they're going to and make a living for so my, my personal view is that we should move the discourse away from preventing migration to facilitating safe migration, right? And that is, that is where kind of I stand on this particular point. Is there a moral case for preventing migration and allowing people to serve their own communities and regions? This was a huge issue, not in the case of internal migration, but international migration in the 1970s in India, a concept called brain drain, right? So in the brain drain issue, people said, People are coming to the IITs and IIMs, getting subsidized education, and then making tons of money in the US, right? So this was a big moral question. And this is exactly what people said. Is there a moral case for telling them you cannot go abroad, right? And because you've been subsidized by government education, you better stay here and serve our own people, right? If you're a doctor, we need you. Why, why are you going to the US, right? But as a famous uh, planning commission member then said, you know, a brain drain is better than a brain in a drain. The idea being uh, uh, not, to, not to kind of put down, put down India, but by saying, let the brain go to where it can work best, right? And you can use this, this particular line that you're, you know, uh, is there a moral case for preventing people? You can do this at multiple spatial scales. I talked about India and people going to the US, but you can say, why should the uh, person born in Bihar serve as a bureaucrat in Maharashtra? That person should serve as a bureaucrat only in Bihar, but you can break it down even further. The person born in a village in Bihar, why should that person serve in a city? Why should that person? So you end up eventually at a place that, you know, this person should be serving only that particular village or a hamlet within a village. 
it's just bizarre. It's not enforceable. My view is let people move, right? So let people move to where they're comfortable, where they're getting a decent uh, a shot at life uh, uh, and give the choice to people rather than in any case, government. So uh, an add on to this question is the moral case of preventing migration, who will make that case of who will take that choice? The government? Right. Is, and I think that's the immorality. How can the government decide whether I want to move from point A to point? Right. I think that's actually a, an even more kind of scary uh, scenario. Having said that, there are, of course, places in India. Right. So, for example, if you tell me somebody has a problem with migration in a big city of India, I laugh right? because most people in cities are migrants. How can you have a problem with migration? But in the tribal heartlands of India, in ecologically sensitive zones, we have laws which say you can't go there. You can't go and settle down there for an ecological reason. You and I can't go to Nicobar Islands. You need a tribal pass to go to Nicobar Islands. Right? So there are special laws in some parts of India. So I'm not a complete free migrationist as well because you have to live within certain realities. And there, of course, there is a moral case for preventing people to go into those zones because you're going to destroy an habitat, uh, potentially an ecolo ecological zone. Uh, in, in which case, you know, you're going to have uh, uh, bad environmental effects. So, yes, I do think there's a moral case for preventing migration to ecologically sensitive zones, right? Uh, to certain areas where indigenous tribes have had a history of kind of losing rights. So you're trying to preserve that. So special cases like that, right? But those are, again, very tiny parts of India. Uh, uh, the, most of India, I think, should be open uh, to move. Again, a related thing with that is, you know, this idea that, you know, everyone should just be where they are and kind of work with their communities. I feel, you know, let people go, let people go, let people serve other communities. In fact, even better. Pluralism in, in, in that sense. Okay, the second question by Raja Singh. Thank you so much. How can society and laws become more welcome and accepting of migrants? Um, by law, you know, we have Article 19, free, freedom of mobility is kind of enshrined in that. Uh, as a society, it's tough. Right? It starts at a very individual level. It starts at the level that the next time you have a conversation with someone and they say, oh, the city is going to the dogs because of migrants, you check that person and say, well, show me the proof, right? I mean, if it is going to say population is growing, you know, population is also growing because of people having more kids and so on inside a city. It's not just about migration. Uh, in fact, most Indian cities have had more natural growth rather than in migration over the last 40 years. So this idea that we can becoming more, more welcome um, starts, of course, at the government level. Right? So government should not be nativist. That is the first. And if your local guy is becoming nativist, you have to question this person saying, you know, uh, India is a free country. You can move from point A to point B. In most places, uh, why are you being so nativist? Right? So that's, that's at the government level. As a government level, we can also promote portability of social security. Why is it that for all these years, until One Nation, One Russian card came a few years back, you could get Russian benefits only at the fair price shop of your village. Today, now you can get it anywhere in India, right? So that's a great thing that's happened in the last few years. Or insurance or Anganwadi services. So many services, you are tied to your place of domicile, right? And it's also a crazy process, even for schools to change domicile. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a crazy process. So as a society, we can be much more welcome if uh, we kind of appreciate the logic of migration, uh, and, uh, and and basically create policies which don't make it so difficult, basically. I mean, the life of a migrant worker in India is quite difficult. You don't know how to get basic stuff uh, um, unless you have civil society organization, NGOs helping you out. You're quite clueless when, when you uh, enter the city. So there's lots of stuff, but uh, to Raja Singh, I'll just say the government of India uh, had its first policy draft uh, on migration in 2017. It's called the, the Working Group Report on Migration. It has a long list of stuff that can be done at the government level. Uh, I was a part of that committee. So, so there is an official government uh, policy document. So we do see that. But I think at the most basic level, we have to be kind. We have to be kind to people uh, who are coming from outside. But again, the migrant also has a, has a responsibility. The migrant is coming to and, and telling me that, you know, look, uh, uh, you know, you, you tore my line. Uh, uh, or my religion is better than your religion, or you know, my language is better than your language. You know that's uh, that's a good case then to get angry with with the migrants. Okay, uh, could you say something about factors that lead to create a sense of belonging in 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 people? Uh, 
So if you're a company, you should try and employ people of different communities of your area, right? I mean, that's a simple way. You know, uh, great companies across, I, I'm in a management school, so I study companies a lot. Great companies have created an atmosphere of trust in the localities that they've been uh, by basically employing people across caste, religion, and all of that, so that people have a shared sense of it. A thing that can be done, by the way, is to, and this comes from history, is to instill a sense of civic pride, especially in the urban history, right? So you go to a place uh, and you really kind of feel something about that urban heritage, right? So, I mean, museum is a very codified way, but in just day-to-day -day kind of uh, uh, speak, uh, you want to be talking more about heritage, about history, history, especially at the city level, so not national and so on, but at a very localized level about how this person, you know, was the first to get electricity to the city and you have some kind of uh, an event around that, kind of build some sense of pr civic pride in that particular place. I think that's a very uh, important uh, part of the question. Uh, and finally, voting, right? If you vote in the place, you automatically get a buy-in. Now, this is something I tell all youngsters, especially in my class. It is very easy to vote anywhere in India, which means getting a new election voting card. Okay. I have voted for the national elections and state elections and municipal elections in Mumbai, in Hyderabad, in Ahmedabad, right? Three cities that I've voted in. And when I went to Telangana, it just took me literally a few hours to get my check by kind of my ID kind of changed from Mumbai to uh, Hyderabad. And now I'm in Ahmedabad, it took me, I think, a day or two to get it changed. So when you vote in a place, of course, you get a sense of belonging. And most migrants in India fail to get this basic idea. They think, oh, I'm from Mumbai, I'll vote only in Mumbai, right? Even if you're living in Delhi for 10 years, right? And so this is something that you can do. Uh, you can always vote in your local elections uh, by just getting your card changed. And it's, it's so easy nowadays to get changed. Uh, that, that's something you should definitely do. One of the reasons why people don't have a sense of belonging is precisely because politicians don't want locals, a lot of migrants, to be able to vote in the local elections. In fact, what often happens in, say, UP, Mumbai, and so on, is the politician from UP comes to Mumbai, takes them back to UP to vote in the UP elections. Whereas, actually, technically, it's the Mumbai politician who should be wooing these migrants so that that person has to provide public goods to the, the guys in Mumbai. So as a result of which, nothing happens in Mumbai because there's no local accountability. Uh, and, uh, you know, these guys are still kind of rooted uh, back there. So sense of belonging comes also from politics. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, a, a simple thing like voting might be, uh, should be pushed for. The Election Commission is toying with this idea of making voting very simple uh, across voters. Uh, Saloni Mundra uh, can't consider push and pull factors in isolation to the political economy of the state and district. Do you think the contract workforce, which has increased, making the petty contractors to bring in more workers, has also been the major factor of increase in migration from the district. Sometimes we focus more on the pool, but should also be on the demand of the urbanized cities and past industrialization. Um, yes, contractors play an important role. Uh, contractors are typically seen as the evil people of uh, India, but they play a very important role in connecting point A to point B. Historically, though, most work-related migration in India has happened without the contractor. There's contractor-based migration, there's network-based migration, which means the guy going from UP to Mumbai is almost always going because his cha-cha is there or his father is there or some family is there, what we call as network-based migration, right? Contractor is an important figure in, and this is a you know, hugely written about topic. A, if you want to know more about contractor's history, there's a great article by Tirthankar Roy, which looks at contractors in Indian economic history. Uh, the contractors in many migration corridors quickly give away to network-based migration, right? So oftentimes contractors are useful to start a migration, but oftentimes they kind of disappear from the scene when the migrants themselves know how to go to uh, 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 the, the next location. Uh, we, need to do, we need to definitely have a better understanding of contractor economy. And in the pandemic, definitely exposed the weaknesses of the system. Nobody knew the contractors. The contractors fled in the pandemic and migrants were stuck in the cities. Right. So local governments definitely need to register contractors very well. Uh, rather than registering migrants, the main focus should be understanding uh, who are the contractors in your area and uh, demanding accountability from them. So that's something that can be done. Uh, the political economy, of course, matters from state to state. Uh, but if you just look at the migration map of India, right? Uh, as I said, you know, it's it's 
basically density. Density is like the number one reason. Uh, 100 years back, it was the number one reason. Today, it's also the number one reason, right? So it's really only that much that the agriculture can support. Uh, if you can show me a district of India, which is very dense, agriculturally speaking, uh, and which does not have too much of out migration, uh, you know, it'll, 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 it'll be the outlier in, 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 in the general theory. Uh, sometimes we focus more on the pull and push factors, but on the so when we, when, we, when we say demand of urbanized cities and fast that that is classically under the framework of pull, right? Now, if you don't like fast industrialization, right, what is the alternative? The alternative is to manage a population agriculture which has grown four times in about a hundred years. The, pro the, the reason we say migration is a good thing for economic development overall is because it releases the surplus labor from one place and takes it to some other place. Uh, that's the economic logic of why migration is good. So if you don't like industrialization, call it serviceization. So not industries, but services. But if you're going to tell me that India can successfully manage its you know, population or India can be a rich country providing a good level of standard of living to all its people with... 50% of our workforce in agriculture, it's not happening. It's impossible. No country in the world has done this, right? So you, we have to move away from agriculture. It doesn't mean killing off agriculture. It means that people will make rational choices and move away from agriculture. So I'm not saying that people should be, you know, forced to leave agriculture, but from agriculture, if prospects are good, people automatically move away from agriculture, right? And so that is why, uh, more people in manufacturing and services than agriculture is a good thing for the country as a whole. Right? Uh, that's 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 my view. That's that's what the economic evidence seems to suggest. Um, any views on the organized migration, hotels and hospitality, which is largely rooted on soft and technical skills? Well, of course, again, you know, there, there's work on this uh, particular area. A lot of this is now staffing companies, right? So companies like Team Lease, com so many companies. Uh, there's a whole. We talked about contractors, but there are these staffing companies which get uh, basically third-party service uh, uh, providers uh, who, who do this. There are now some regulations which have kicked in. I think some states, if you extend your framework also to gig workers, Rajasthan has just passed a law on unorganized you know, uh, workers, uh, unorganized, providing social security to gig workers. So definitely, uh, we need more social security in a large number of informal sector jobs. And I'm, I'm of the view that the government should provide it. So I'm very clear that the government should be giving money in almost a very direct sense to insurance or you know, uh, provident funds in a variety of ways directly rather than putting the onus on the employer uh, because that often does not work. So you know, let the government do it. Let the taxpayer fund this uh, rather than... Uh, because there's one view. That, the classical view is that the employer should look after the employee, right? Uh, which is very nice, except that nobody's going to do it in India. We're just too evil, uh, put it very bluntly, as employers to actually do it. I mean, how many of us uh, uh, employ domestic helps and have a written contract? Right? It's, we, we like it to be informal. Right? So there is something on the employer and employee side which kind of uh, uh, dictates this. And uh, to kind of force employers to do a lot of things is, in my view, is often counterproductive. So government should step in and uh, if if... Uh, the idea is, you know, to, to improve uh, the livelihood option in these sectors. I personally don't know enough about hotel and hospitality, so you have to excuse me on that particular. Uh, is the 19th century, there's a migration for people to the northwest part of the world. What is the effect on their culture then? Uh, so I don't know what northwest means, but yeah, I mean, people went abroad to the plantation economies. A lot of this was exploitative indenture. A lot of it was free migration. Uh, the biggest impact of 19th century out-migration was the Indian freedom movement, right? I mean, you think of all the stalwarts of the Indian freedom movement, almost all of them went abroad, right? Uh, from, you know, Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar, Patel, like just the whole galaxy of people. Uh, and it's not a coincidence. They went abroad, they were exposed to ideas, uh, and uh, they were exposed to ideas of democracy. And they said, you know, the British rule, if they have elections in Britain, why can't we have elections here for our own people. It was such a simple observation, uh, which kind of galvanized the freedom movement. So the biggest impact of that migration was that we got freedom, uh, uh, which is really underappreciated otherwise, right? Uh, it's not like it just happened out of a, a vacuum. Effect on culture. Yeah, I think, I think, I think the freedom movement impacted a lot of things uh, uh, back then. Uh, do migrants by choice settle better socially? Uh, this is a question by Suhas. 
uh, than the forced migrants who are basically poor. And so, uh, so if you're forced, again, depends on what kind of force, so if it's like a damn displacement, damn induced displacement, if it is a riot, right? Uh, you're really destitute poor. You're moved into a really bad temporary shelter, which becomes kind of permanent over 10, 20 years. So yeah, the short answer is yes. I mean, people who settle by choice are definitely going to be doing much better than people who are being forced. Are there examples of forced migration where people have kind of done okay over time? And one example that comes to mind is Tibetan settlements, right? So people who came from Tibet, of course, they want to go back and you know, all of that is there. But the settlements themselves, I think, have done a very good job. Uh, and there was once a famous, uh, well, uh, an academic study which looked at satisfaction levels comparing Kashmiri Pandits who were dislocated and Tibetans. Uh, uh, and they found the Tibetans to be much happier. Right? So, so, so there are interesting studies. There are all sorts of studies on migration. Uh, but even within the world of forced migration, you can have a gradation. You can have... Sri Lankan Tamils, for example, who had a quite a, a, a bad, bad kind of a experience compared to say the Tibetans and so on. Uh, of course, you can settle down by choice and also have a bad, bad deal, right? But then that's uh, okay. I'm going to zip through a few and then wrap up in five minutes. Do you think that urbanization cover the entire globe? In a sense, will village cease to exist? Future agriculture and food security. Um, this one fallacy that you know, if everyone is living in cities, then we won't have food. Right? I mean, the whole argument is that the US is able to feed itself, Europe is able to feed itself with just less than 5% of its population working on agriculture. The argument in this whole thing is not about people, it's about agricultural yields. Right? They are making much more on a per acre basis than what they were doing 200 years back. Now, you can have a logic saying, oh, that's pesticides, that's fertilizers, that's not sustainable. But the fact is that you know, the, I, I just say recommend you know reading this guy called Vaclav Schmil. Uh, the world today can sustain seven billion people. Fifty years back, people did not think that was possible, right? Uh, and so we've crossed the fifty percent mark on global urbanization. It's expected to be seventy percent, eighty percent. India, by the way, is urbanizing very slowly. I can give a whole separate talk on that. We say rapid urbanization and so on. India is actually urbanizing very, very slow. Urbanization meaning the share of population living in cities. And to me, that's a bad thing. I feel India should urbanize more rapidly. That's a, that's a view I, I take. Uh, but no, I don't think we're going to compromise on food security because more people will live in uh, cities. Yes, a few people will always live in villages. It's not never going to be in everyone living in cities, but it's about the percentage. The pre-modern society was at 5% urban or less, and the modern society is going to be 60 or 6% urban or more. Are we going to change because we're going to work from home and so on? No. You know, so there's a whole thing during the pandemic that now we don't need to live in cities. No. We love people. We love to attract with people. We love to live in cities. Right? And a simple thought experiment for you is where are you going to learn? Where are you going to live in your life? Right? Uh, and most likely you're going to live not only in a city, but in the top 20 city of India in terms of population. Right? And you should ask yourself, why is that happening? And if I'm going to make this choice, others also likely to make this choice. Uh, people learn migration from birds. Uh, <laughs> you can use analogies, right? Um, I use it in my book. For example, Ganjam is a district I mentioned, and uh, it's also the uh, home to the Chilka Lake. A lot of migratory birds are there, and you know, massive ma mass migration of birds, and there's mass migration of humans from the same region all the way across to Gujarat, right? So both birds and humans are moving from Ganjam outside. But these are analogies. Uh, if you learn something, let me know. Uh, and I'll be you know, happy to learn from you about how we can learn much more concretely. Uh, but yes, bird migration is fascinating. I'm a complete migration buff, right? So I see the word migration anywhere and it, my eyes light up. So if you, if you send me an article on bird migration, I will read it. Uh, Rajesh has a question on um, ecosystem people, those who live seasonal migrants, health of our natural resources. I think that's a, that's a very important question. Uh, seasonal migration often gives way to longer duration migrations. Uh, so it's often a transition stage in the migration kind of uh, uh, categorization. Um, there's no doubt that a lot of these natural resource quality is getting degraded at a very fast rate. Uh, and all I'll say is that, you know, I mean, 
the answer to that is not a complete reversal of industrialization. That's a, that's not a position that I would take. Uh, we have to find creative solutions for this uh, that still provide jobs uh, away from agriculture. Right. So so again, my answer is you know you have to find ways to take people away from agriculture. It it might sound cruel, but uh, but this is the harsh economic reality which I strongly. Believe. Uh, Soam Thomas, migrants are almost always underpaid in the huge informal workforce. Yeah, they are underpaid, but remember, again, the migration logic, they are underpaid in respect to whom? Underpaid in respect, in some cases, to natives, maybe. But the migrant is not making the comparison that you are making. The migrant is comparing on what the, the person is making back home. So. This is a classic kind of error people make. I think a job should be, you know, uh, giving the person a hundred rupees per hour, hypothetically, and the migrant is getting only eighty rupees per hour. So you call it exploitation. But the migrant was getting forty rupees back home, right? So the migrant is happy that the migrant is getting eighty rupees. Now there are a lot of concerns here. You want a minimum standard of, you know, basic minimum wage? Yes. If hundred is that, you know, you want the migrant to get that. So that's a moral issue. But the migrant often does not mind this because the migrant is getting a much better deal than back home. Right? And that is why you need to understand migration psychology. Uh, I'm not saying you should go and exploit migrants, but, uh, but you have to pay attention to why migrants are there in this vast informal workforce. Because things are so bad back home uh, that, uh, that people don't mind working in sectors. Yes, in the long run, clearly these dirty jobs, so to speak, need to disappear. Uh, and uh, and people need to be moved away from these jobs, and the only way that can happen is you know by by kind of education and stuff like that. Uh, do we agree that if villages get better facilities, forced tremendous migration be reduced, distressed migration? Short answer: It's tough to disentangle, right? So yeah, you can say distressed migration might reduce. In a very strange way, you know, sometimes distressed migration is also the first time that people start seeing the world, establish contacts, networks that can then lead to more you know, longer duration migrations. So yes, you avoid forced, you avoid distress from a very linguist, language kind of way. You know, these are good things, right? But in my view, you want people to be exposed to the world outside. The more you keep people just out there, it's in my view, not gonna do too much on a very long-term basis. Uh, you need to cultivate contacts around, you need, I mean, just think of your own lives. You know, you you know people around in different places. You can call them, ask them about opportunities. Are there opportunities here? So you want people to have contacts in different places, uh, and that's something that migration does. So if you're going to keep communities, keep people just in one place, locked in place, so, so to speak, in the long run, it's not good. So you don't want distress. Uh, and if villages get better facilities, of course they should get better facilities. But you should stop expecting that people will stay there. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying don't develop the villages. Please develop the villages, but don't think that people will stay there. They will move. And you can't, you, you should not see out migration as a failure. I think that's the worst thing that people do is saying, oh, people are leaving Kerala, so Kerala is doomed. Kerala is doing very well on a lot of dimensions, right? Uh, so uh, you can't just write off Kerala because a lot of people go to the top. Okay, last two points. Uh, I'm sorry I'm extending the time here. Um, so Neeraj has, has this question, uh, question specific to tribal areas. Yeah, it, it's a very dense question. I'm, I, I don't think I fully understand it. I, I think I appreciate the sentiment out here. Um, let me just put it broadly. It's a question linked with tribes and migration, right? So uh, again, the psychology of uh, a lot of people who be belong to these communities is very different. That is, living with nature is a very strong sentiment uh, linked with spirituality, linked with a lot of things, which I'm not going to say, you know, for your long-term survival, you have to move. If people are going to be making the choice to live in a particular way, I'm going to be the last person to enforce people to move because I think they will do well in the long run, right? Uh, but if you see the actual migration patterns of Adivasi communities in India, right? It's interesting because people are making the choice 
of moving to nearby towns for work or education and so on, which is pretty similar to what we're seeing for other social groups. Right? So at least when I look at migration data, uh, again, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but I do think that fundamentally the need to move, uh, the need to explore the world exists even here. Right? Um, in my book, I do talk about uh, you know, some of the nomadic tribes which are hit by the railways and so on uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and the British did a lot of things which were very bad for many of these tribal communities. Uh, they kind of, you know, basically criminalized many of these tribes and so on. So, so that's a different topic altogether. Uh, but the British were very concerned, interestingly, that they were migrants, right? And because they moved, it unsettled, unsettled the British idea of they couldn't know how, they didn't know how to tax them, right? If you were settled on a land, you could charge land revenue. But if you were nomadic, what do you charge them? So there are all these interesting debates in the, in, in the, in the 19th century. So there's this whole question about the other, is the vision of migration sugar milk possible without addressing? So obviously it's a, it's a tough question to answer. I'm very idealistic. I think all these things are uh, possible, but you know, in the last three days, there's so much of violence in India. Uh, somebody shot in the train, somebody's, uh, there's like, flames in Haryana, stuff happening in Manipur. So at any snapshot of time, there's idealism and there's what's happening in the real world. Uh, but all I'll say is that the sugar in the milk is a wonderful analogy, which I use in my own daily living. And uh, the small, the only thing I can do as an individual is to influence a few people around me uh, and help them see the cause that look, uh, if uh, we, and you basically, what you do as individuals is to play up the contributions of migrants, right? For example, one of the things I often tell people is, especially people of age jingoistic is, you know, uh, India won this war against Pakistan in 1971, Bangladesh and so on. And it turns out that some of the important people in the Indian military establishment, in a way, number one, number two, Sam Manik Shaw and F.R. Jacob, was a Parsi and a Baghdadi Jew, right? So you have a, an event which happened in 1971, which is partly a result of two individuals who belong to descendants of people who came from outside, right? So here's an event which is very central in military history, but is in a way has a huge contribution of descendants of migrants. Right. And that's how I think one needs to think. So if you're talking about, uh, you know, contributions, for example, in business, I always in class talk about, you know, famous Muslim entrepreneurs, right? So you have Sipla, one of the global pharma houses started by uh, Muslim entrepreneurs, or you have Azim Premji of Lipro. And you need to play up these examples to show that, you know, these, everyone has been contributing so much uh, in, in different ways. So yeah, I'm, I'm very idealistic on, on, on that count. Uh, Urban centers can can still not touch the Abadi area as it goes to engulf it. You, what is your take on the semi-urban kind of development? Uh, well, all urban expansion has this. You cannot expand a city without serving more land. As, as simple as that. I mean, if, if you go to Mumbai today, Mumbai was a bunch of seven islands. They joined it, right? And uh, the island which is south, South Bombay as it's known famously for snobbery and so on, uh, South Bombay basically was the main stuff where people went. And they were just fields in the places that we call Bandra and the Santa Cruz Airport. And, and I'm just talking about a city which I belong to. All of that was fields. All of that was rural. Right? And today, if you go there, that is heart of urban Mumbai. In fact, there are more people on that part of the island than the South Bombay. So all urban expansion takes land. right? It's, 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 uh, so this whole semi-urban business, I've, I, I read the literature. Uh, I, I appreciate people studying it. But it's like, you know, if a person from Bandra is studying what's happening in Vasai, the person just has to read Bandra's history to know that Bandra was Vasai, you know, eight years back. So, so in a way, all urban expansion, by definition, takes away the land around it, which is almost by definition agricultural. Uh, and village, and that is why you have names like, you know, in, in, in Karnataka, Halli, and in, in, in Andhra Pradesh, Palli, right? So you have like, uh, Bilika Halli. This is where I study in Bangalore. Bilika Halli. It was a village, and these become place place names in in cities. Uh, so they are they are going to engulf it. That's how change happens. Uh, and uh, do you want to still preserve it untouched? I think it's impossible. And as long as you're not stealing these lands from these people, that is unethical. But uh, if uh, people are getting a good market price for their land uh, and uh, good opportunities. Uh, it is again inevitable. Um, 
because at the end of the day the lands that we are sitting on right now was also farmland once upon a time so uh, that's that's how you should see it thank you so much uh, professor tumbe for this uh, for really uh, giving us so much time and and uh, uh, helping us uh, explore the many ramifications of this con phenomena that is very much part of our world and an increasing one i'm sure this uh, this discussion uh, has helped bring more clarity to many of our participants and um, helped us understand much better uh, thank you to the participants as well for their very thoughtful questions uh, which you know help bring out the many nuances of uh, the phenomena of migration. Uh, the recording of this lecture will be posted on our uh, YouTube channel and will be shared with you. Um, thank you, friends. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And I must say, excellent questions. So, yeah, thank you so much. And thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you.